Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We have come to the beginning yet again this morning, the beginning of the Christian liturgical year, marked by this first Sunday in Advent, the beginning of a season set aside for waiting and preparation. I think it reveals something about us that we have to schedule this in, the waiting time in particular. I notice that for myself, and perhaps you feel this way as well, waiting is not something that comes naturally. As a parent, I often remind my own children of the value of patience, but know that it is one of those lessons that I must, to at I must attend to for myself as well. In typical years, this Advent time as held in the church contrasts significantly with the post-Thanksgiving mad rush to Christmas Day that holds hostage the rest of our lives. Buy a tree, decorate the home, write letters to Santa, meet end of year deadlines, study like mad, work extra shifts, make arrangements for travel, plan the big meal, just get by to December 26 or 31 or January 1st or that mythical time when it will all slow down. This is what we contend with most years as we arrive in the season of waiting. But we know that 2020 is not like most years. For in this peculiar year, we have spent months waiting. Waiting for news of the next shutdown, the next set of election results, the next life taken precipitating more protests, waiting for test results, for stimulus checks, for notice from the landlord, for a vaccine and a plan and a rollout, waiting for the chance to see a loved one long isolated, waiting to feel safe enough to venture out, waiting for this all to be over for life to return to something we once knew as normal. Waiting is all that we have done in this year, patiently sometimes, but let's be honest, mostly not so patient. Are we really ready to willingly enter into an entire season devoted to it? I am not convinced that I am. Tear open the heavens and come down. The prophet Isaiah is speaking my language this morning. The not so advent appropriate pit of the stomach anxiety that accompanies just about every waking moment. Come thou long expected Jesus. We are dying here. 257,000 in this country have died, and 1.4 million people in your world to COVID have mercy. Black and brown bodies sacrificed on the altar of misplaced fear and white supremacy have mercy. Philadelphia, with the highest homicide rate in recent history, 441 people taken already, and we are not at year's end, have mercy. Families losing their homes, children without enough food, hospitals having to redirect patients, first responders exhausted, we are exhausted, have mercy. What are you waiting for, Lord? Tear open the heavens 
and come down. Isaiah is speaking the language of his own community. Where we begin this morning is the second half of a fuller communal lament, a litany of God's greatness and the people's failings, God's anger and the people's frustration, God's mercy and the people's relief, God's disappearance and the people's search. Isaiah's community grew up in exile, knowing nothing other than occupation, of waiting to be set free, they heard stories of the temple destroyed, disrupting any notions of a God with and for them. For how could God be with them if there was no common sacred place in which they could worship? How could God be for them if all they had seen was desolation? Here we find a people fed up with waiting longer than eight months, a year, three years, generations. The time of exile and occupation have been long. While they find themselves now back in Jerusalem, nothing on this side of history looks the same. They are trying to put life back together again from scattered puzzle pieces of fantastic stories told to them of what it looked like before, Isaiah remembers for them as if in a dream the God who brought their ancestors out of Egypt, who broke the bondage of slavery, who felt their distress and acted to relieve it, who parted the waters to bring them from certain death into new life. They have been waiting. Their parents waited and their grandparents before them. What are you waiting for, Lord, for our sake? Come. In the midst of such extended waiting for what we want to see, what we thought we might see, waiting for dreams to be realized, we draw down on our reserves of hope. Hope that something will change. Hope that others or I can behave differently. Hope that anything we can do makes a difference. Hope that God is attending to us as promised. It is in these cases when it is clear that the people are near to despair that prophets draw upon the well of lament, much like the psalmist, to give voice to a people lost, a people uncertain of their God, those near dried up of hope, a people crying out for justice, languishing in shared pain. They draw on communal lament because it is a last claim on hope. And they remind us that to lament is not to despair. Reverend Deborah Van Dusen Hunsinger makes this distinction well, writing that when the people of God undergo trial and cry out for deliverance, lament is faith's alternative to despair. When healing fails, lament is the hopelessness that refuses to give up. When injustice prevails, lament is the protest that digs in for the long haul. When humiliation abounds, lament is the self-respect that cries out to a hidden God, how long, O oh Lord? Lament bends anguish and anger into ardent supplication. Lament risks everything on God. It refuses the shell of cynicism that would protect its vulnerable heart. When I think on lament in these ways, I think to the very first and now annual public recitations of the names of those killed in the September 11, 2001 attacks, each year named at the precise time of their death. 
or to the people who came out onto the streets the day that George Floyd was killed, or Breonna Taylor, or Walter Wallace, and those who still gather on streets around this country unwilling to go unheard. I think to Transgender Day of Remembrance, just this past week, when the names of those beloved children of God who were killed in incidents of anti-transgender violence are lifted up and honored in the presence of a community still working towards a day when no one has to be afraid to be who God made them. Communal lament is a call to action to not be satisfied with burying our grief and moving on. It is a means of honestly naming our shared pain and laying bare a cry for hope. Isaiah calls his people into this action of lament in the midst of their desolation and still waiting time. He equips them with this language of lament to name their impatience and their complicity. He provides words demanding response to call God and themselves to account. So important is this piece, the responsibility that the community bears, that Isaiah implicates himself alongside them, modeling that even in lament, the community is called to account for her own actions. You were angry and we sinned, cries the prophet to God. You hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean. You have delivered us into our iniquity. The second part is at first counterintuitive. Are we not in danger of blaming the victim, we wonder? How can we hold accountability and lament in the same hand? Very tenderly, of course, and with great intention to move where our confession leads us. Just as lament is an act of hope, so is honest accounting and reflection. It is easy to look upon the rest of the world for injustice, for the injustice, the pain that we see and feel so deeply, and to point fingers, to scream to the heavens wondering why God hides her face from us, to rail at the TV wondering how others could do such a thing, believe such a thing, follow such a person to release ourselves from responsibility because we were not there. We did not know. We wouldn't say those things. Yet I believe the church can model a different way, just as the prophet did, the way that holds pain and accepts responsibility naming where we have perpetuated unjust systems, where we have attempted to take hold of God and manipulate her into our own image, where we have been easily carried on the winds of self-importance, where we have failed to dream with the vision of those who trust that God has and is making a way where we have failed to live up to God's dreams for us. So I wonder, what if all of this, this lamentation and this honest accounting shaped our waiting time in this Advent season? What if, in preparing to welcome God who comes before us in weakness and vulnerability, what if we, this year, accepted a similar posture? Rather than basking in the light, 
What if we searched the shadows for the places where hope has died or is barely holding on? and then make space for these stories to be told in the fullness of their pain. I know that this must feel like a Lenten call and not one for Advent. Though we did all acknowledge at the start that 2020 is certainly a year like none other. I admit It has always struck me how these two seasons are not all that different from one another. Each one attempts to stop us where we are, invites us to reorient and remember that this world in which we live is God's world. It is God who created it. It is Christ who will redeem it. In the end, This is what we are waiting for, is it not? As endless as the wait feels, as hopeless at times, tedious and painful and urgent. But our waiting is not inactive. We have a role. The truth that many of us know is that waiting time is often the most active time a time of painful longing and bold allegiance, a time of deep cleansing and preparation, a time of attentiveness, of staying awake to the possibilities around us. Whether we are waiting the birth of a child or the reconciliation of all creation. Should we choose, church, in this peculiar Advent season, to draw on the well of lament and honest reflection, I suspect that we might find ourselves set free. Free to trust ourselves and others again. Freed from anxiety and fear and loathing. Free to hope again. Free to rest in the knowledge that God has come and will come again. So as we begin this season, I invite you to join me now in a prayer of lament. Let us pray. Gracious God, we lament because your children are dead and dying and we wish it were not so. Come, thou long-expected Jesus, set thy people free. We mourn the loss of futures. Come, thou long-expected Jesus, set thy people free. We ache over our inability to imagine other ways than violence. Come, thou long-expected Jesus, set thy people free. We lament being caught in webs of racism, both past and present. Come, thou long-expected Jesus, set thy people free. We mourn that sin is so deep within us all. Come, thou long-expected Jesus, set thy people free. We ache because the problems are deeper than we can grasp and they feel beyond our control. Come, thou long expected Jesus, set thy people free. From our fears and sins release us. Let us find our rest in thee. Amen.